All right. It's already the last talk of the first day. <laughs> it's been a great, uh, been a great Friday. I'm sure the weekend proved, will prove to be just as great. Uh, thanks to the culture for bringing this together and for considering my paper. Um, I think and hope that uh, the paper will um, can be put into conversation with this kind of things we've been talking about today. So my paper is called The Machine to Speak for Them, Jonathan Key and the Vocal Degranulation of the Japanese Canadian Interned. During the Second, Second World War, I should actually start my time. During the Second World War in March 1942, fueled by pre-existent uh, discrimination and strong-armed through Parliament by Prime Minister King, the Canadian government decreed that all persons of the Japanese race would be forcibly and without question moved from their homes and away from the coast of British Columbia under the justification that the landed immigrants and their second generation descendants could become part of a Japanese land invasion. I know. Some 20,000 Canadian citizens and landed immigrants were forcibly evacuated from their homes by the end of October 1942. The majority of dislocated families and individuals were eventually moved to derelict, nearly empty towns that had been built and abandoned during the British Columbia gold rushes of the late 1800s. In 1943, Jonathan Alexander Key set off to visit New Denver, one such ghost town internment camp. By the time Key arrived in Denver, the 1,500 Japanese uh, Canadians displaced there, having suffered through a devastating winter, had become comparatively settled in their new residences. Key was an assistant professor of sociology in the Department of Anthropology, Criminology, and Sociology at the Brit uh, University of British Columbia, and he brought with him one of the first commercial tape recording machines. I'm not sure if everyone knows what a tape <laughs> recording machine is. His purpose for and use of the tape is most surprising, for he was one of the first documented users to cut and reconnect tape to make extended use of editing. Key with the intent to facilitate language fluency, granulated and manipulated the voices of the first generation interned. The tape recorder had a sweeping influence on recording practices, the malleability of its use uh, now embodying contemporary recording technologies. Yet how can we read within this cultural artifact this early gesture of keys? How is it that Key decided to take scissors to the tape, to read here the pieces with the intent of manufacturing a now seemingly seamless whole. What informed Key's approach to the voice, specifically the voice of the other, as a separatable, malleable material to be manipulated by himself and a machine? Essentially, this mentality reveals a relationship to technology, the voice, and sound, proliferated by the uh, interaction of recording machines, the war, and conceptions of the other, and the pervasion of capitalist modes of utility. In other words, the attended tendency to supplant supplement the voice, and as a corollary, delineate its usability in terms of the privileging of data and meaning. Tape cutting marks a shift from technological sound reproduction to sound manipulation as a means to an end that was rooted in hegemonic notions of cultural purity. <coughs> it was Derrida and Lacan who, among others and in specific ways, reattuned our ears to the voice, laying bare the voice's association with power while also appealing to the ambiguous, contrary, and often tenuous relation of the voice to the self. These insights have not been lost on sound scholarship, yet the fatalistic tendency that these earlier approaches developed had themselves been problematized with notions of materiality, performativity, and technology. Indeed, without, such notions, uh, without taking such notions into account, <coughs> one might be tempted to trivialize Keith's pedagogical editing, editing of the voice of the interned, since the inherent dissociative violences within the voice are always already imposed on any given subject anyway. Yet theorists like Christopher Cox problematize this temptation. Cox writes on what he sees as the under-theorization of sound art's exploration of the material aspects of sound. And despite not being sound art, Key's work with, the, with sound and machines bears an uncanny resemblance to the granulation and manipulation of the voice in a great deal of contemporary sound art. Thus, when Cox writes that sound art, quote, has explored the materiality of sound, its texture and temporal flow, its palpable effect on and affective 
and affection by the materials and against which it is transmitted, end quote, we could also understand this as a kind of methodological approach to theorizing Key's work. Cox requires us to ask, what did Key's practice do? Mladen Dollar, whose work nonetheless informs a great deal of the understanding of the politics of the voice in this paper, occasionally eschews this kind of analysis in the following way. In discussing the alterity of the voice and the influence of the big O other inherent in inner dialogue, Dollar refers to the tape machine in a note. He writes, there is a more banal experience which demonstrates the alterity of the voice. Hearing one's own voice on tape always, or at least initially, fills one with horror and displeasure. <laughs> it's true. Comparing this experience to seeing oneself in the mirror, also in a stubbornly uncanny experience, his point is well taken, but the banality of such an experience of horror is undoubtedly historically situated. Surely the interned experience such uncanniness but for them, the experience was yet not yet banal. In other words, we must attend to the historicity of this banality. What is it about the function of the tape recorder and the interrelation with the voice that caused the general naturalization of the experience of hearing one's voice from a machine? This move shifts critical attention strictly from a consideration of the relationship of the voice to the self to the means by which a relationship among the machine, the voice, and the self is made possible. It shifts the attention from contemplating the existence of the recorded voice to prior questions concerning the process of the move towards mechanistic vocal manipulation. Crucially, the split of the, vo uh, the, split of the voice and the subject becomes the conceptual principle under which the tape machine is conceived and mobilized. Thus, the editing machine need not be defined through a negative relation to the speaking subject and its self-other dialectic, but rather bears a positive relation to the voice. In a word, the voice was already a technology of the self. As an organizing principle, the voice comes to map not only the early process of recording production, i.e. the early gesture of using the voice's material to record, but functions more curiously as a map of the process of sound processing and editing itself. In other words, editing is a conceptual possibility in recording technologies depend on an abstraction of and from the voice as a mechanism for constructing the splitting of the self, especially in terms of second languages, the voice of the other, and the particular self-other politics instigated through and exacerbated by the Second World War. The, voice, uh, the focus on the voice is central to understanding what is specific to the technologies we commonly refer to as sound editing machines. People have always manipulated the voice. Speech and, speech and singing are already techniques for the manipulation of the technology <coughs> of the voice. Undoubtedly, subjectivity has always interacted with technologies, uh, technological extensions like tools. Thus, the novelty of sound manipulation in general is not to be found with the voice. Musical ex instruments existed uh, before recorded history. What has changed, however, is that contemporary media technologies are less and less things we use, becoming more and more pathways through a relational ontology quote Mr. David there. We witnessed this transitioning in Key's teaching. The media and music technologies that have been shaped into sound manipulation technologies are distinguished by their relation to the voice, including granulation, speed, etc. They are not simply understood to imitate the voice, but are themselves understood by Key, for example, as an imitation of the process of the voice. Therefore, not only were early recording uh, manipulation technologies and media for the voice, they were of the voice. Their history is tied to the history of the voice itself, to the considerations of the voice in relation to, the self, uh, to itself, the voice both uh, of and other to the self, the self and the external other, the voice's possibility uh, as a kind of usability, and the notion of uh, the supplementation and manipulation of that self other through technology. Voice and sound manipulation technologies are best understood as the result of a proliferation of a particular set of practices and practical understandings concerning the voice and the subject, and not the cause. This is to say that new sound manipul manipulation technologies had no impact on the relations to the voice and the subject either. Rather, they, rather, they had a very large impact in the way in which those relations then developed through those technologies. 
still the, uh, these technologies were embedded in sociocultural currents that they themselves did not create. It is integral to emphasize that it was the voice of the other that was to be manipulated. The tape machine's ease of editing presented a possible new pedagogical solution for Key, teaching the first generation Japanese to speak with no accent. Key had been a major voice of dissent against the University of British Columbia's decision to deny the continued enrollment of over 60 second generation Japanese Canadian students, a decision made during the initial stages, initial stages of the Japanese Canadian internment. Against this, Key situated his approach in direct opposition to the uh, institutional discrimination. For Key, the removal of what he understood as uh, vowels after consonants at the end of words characteristic of Japanese language speakers speaking in English was an attempt to remove the excess from the first generation speech in an effort to foster assimilative attitudes among other Canadians. The vast majority of second generation Japanese Canadians had no accents, had gone through the Canadian education system since birth, and in many cases could not speak Japanese. Key then, in a friendly correspondence explaining his choice to, uh, to work with the first generation Japanese Canadians, writes, sorry, of his desire to, quote, help to remove those cumbersome articulations in an effort to make their English sound Canadian in such a way to facilitate a sense of ease for the listener. This is from letters, his personal correspondence. Key's conception of the voice was that it was subdivided into sections that went beyond words and grammar, one that conceived of the sound of the voice as having both meaningful and meaningless and therefore usable and useless components, a conception of the sound of the voice itself as a divisible technology. The understanding of the tape recorder as a machine to identify and physically augment the material of the voice, therefore both informed and grew out of Key's mentality. Key's process was as, was as follows. He would ask his willing student to say the, name, uh, to say the same prescribed English sentence twice and record the results on two separate tapes. Key would then spend some time privately splicing one tape, physically removing what he concluded were the extra vowel sounds, and then reattaching the tape together. He would then play the two tapes to his student so that they would hear their own voice without the inflections. The student, Key postulated, could then gradually modulate their voice to mimic the edited tape. The grain of the voice of the other could now be both emphasized and de-emphasized. He writes, getting my hands on this machine was paramount to my whole project. It bears witness to the possibility of speech learning, a machine to speak for them, a machine that would allow them to hear clearly where their accent is causing issue without them having to speak themselves. Key's use of the device would allow the accented speakers to hear clearly the differences in their English speech, not with him, but with themselves. Indeed, Key is also suggesting a more significant role for the machine as a supplement to the human voice. A machine to speak for them suggests not just clarification of the voice, but rather delegating the voice. Key's planned use for the tape recorder, which indeed in some ways has come to fruition, was to use editing as a kind of biofeedback for any speaking subject. Key's whole conceptual schema for his pedagogical approach, then, relies on a basic abstract principle treating the voice as an effect or an event that can be captured, edited, and perfected. The advantage of the tape recorder was simply that it presented a durable and malleable physical rec uh, record of the voice. And although this pedagogical approach is infrequently applied to contemporary language learning education, although there's some apps that I've seen use this, it's influential in both everyday and institutional identity politics is clear. One cannot fault a language learner the desire to speak to those whose language they are learning, of course. Indeed, the nuanced vocal gesturing of any, uh, of, sorry, the nuanced vocal gesturing of and listening to performative rhetoric, uh, rhetorical strategies is ethically important. Yet not only was Key an enforcer, but he failed to understand what was the culturally rooted and performative significance of the extra semantic gesturing uh, he deduced as excess. As Key's teaching clearly shows, 
the affordances of the machine itself are not only indicative of social mentalities, but also lay bare the political relations and assumptions through the machine's use. This is, of course, present in any technology. Key's pedagogical tape machine is a particularly clear elucidation of this point, however, not only because of its critical readability, but also because of its formative position as one of the first, if not the first, example of tape editing, predating both Hamil L. Dobbs as well as Pierre Schaeffer's work with tape. Key wanted to correct the accent as an attempt to reconcile a self-presence in the voice, yet by a specific and culturally rooted, culturally rooted notion of self-presence. In these terms, Key's attempt to de-emphasize the accent is in effect its re-emphasis in a new context. For it is in the non-sense of the voice, the aspects of the voice dissociated from meaning, that perturbs Key and moves him to remove what he conflates as being the non-self in that non-sense of the other. Key fails to recognize the performativity that leaks through from the first language into the spoken second. Paradoxically then, he does not acknowledge as existing the very thing he wants to remove, namely the way of being for the other. For its removal will once again allow what is excess in the voice, especially in the grain of the voice of the other, to disappear, restoring comfort in the voice as the seat of pure self-accountability. In other words, he does not see that removing what he considers to not matter is actually an implicit and tacit acceptance of the importance of this remainder. Achieved through this reversal, in the McLuhan sense of uh, the machine, of the tape machine as a recording device, what is removed as is and seen as illegitimate is simultaneously what is the most regulated and redefined under the logic, under the logic of its removal. Key's practice to remove the accent is to impose regulation in at least two ways. First, the participating interned, because not even understanding themselves, uh, perhaps not even understanding themselves in the first unedited recording, become other to themselves. The contradictory discourse that grew through the war and was then legitimized by the government that said, these people are Canadians that are not Canadians, is tragically dramatized in even this first recording. And secondly, if the first recording uh, of their voice becomes other to themselves, then in the second recording, the voice becomes the big O other self, the ideal self, as a correctly, safely speaking subject, both in terms of the state and subjectivity. Regrettably then, what the state attempted to instigate through a flawed logic of restriction, as states tend to do, Key unknowingly attempted to uh, complete through the material and reverse logic of the tape <coughs> machine. It is for this reason that many interned, Key reports, felt animosity towards his lessons. Just as the intern resented their body's displacement, so did they resent their voice's displacement. Their dis-placed places are akin to the bracket, non-bracket removed elements of their accent. Further, these state actions cast the continued institutional, sorry, further these state actions cast the continued institutional language restrictions through exemption of Canada and other multicultural nation states under a suspicious light. Essentially, the institutional delegitimization of languages other than French and English works retroactively and silently reveals the nation state's fear of the limit point of its own functionality, namely the impossibility of a truly multilingual state apparatus. The Canadian government's decision to intern the Japanese Canadians reveal what Hart and Negri call the anachronicity of the concept of the people once again ideologically revealed through Key's approach. That there was a necessity to segregate state and then assimilate Key, the interned, reveals the perceived effort needed to maintain the people. One comes to understand that multiculturalism in the nation state's discourse is often ideological. In Canada, languages other than English and French are still placed under the de-emphasis, re-emphasis logic of outside-inside with but other. Thus, while Key's intentions were for the assimilation and inclusion of the Japanese Canadians, it was from a gesture of attempted erasure. Many of the interns saw his practice as a, co a continued attempt at the removal of their identity. Key advocated for the full reintegration of Japanese Canadians into mainstream Western Canada, yet in such a way that delegitimized various Japanese Canadian ways of knowing and interacting. The Japanese Canadians were Canadian 
insofar as they adapted to Anglo-Canadian forms of speaking and thus embodiment, their Japanese-ness not a legitimate mode of being in social discourse. Key understood accents fundamentally as an impediment to overcome, as opposed to a way of being in the world. Behind Key's, practic uh, behind Key's practical task lay a very particular notion of language, speech, and what it means to be human. These notions included the understanding of the voice as relating to increasingly prevalent discourses of individualism and agency, along with the understanding of the primacy of meaning and the interrelation of the subject and the voice. Ironically, the result is not the erasure of accents, but its fetishization. Sound manipulation rose, arose, in other words, in part, from an attempt to have machines speak for the other, to remove the grain of the other in translation. It arose from an attempt to solve or at least contain the cultural problem of difference.